Welcome to Ask the Experts. I'm Jill Schlesinger, editor at large of CBS Money Watch, and I'm joined by Jack Otter, executive editor of CBS Money Watch. Oh God, we have got a big guest in the room today. Very big, yeah. It's uh, it's rocking. Liz Ann <laughs> Saunders, chief investment strategist at Charles Schwab and Company. You got You have a very long bio here. I don't want to read the sorry, whole don't thing. I know. Sorry, don't read the whole thing. But I want to do some highlights. Let me start with the most important thing, which is in 2006. Lizanne was named one of Smart Money's Power 30. It's a list of the most influential people on Wall Street. She was named Best Strategist of, of 2009 by Kiplinger's. Oh, I'm just mentioning the Smart Money because that was yours, right, Jack? You <laughs> it did was. That. I that did. Was okay. Lead that story. Um, she's, um, you know what? She's like a super duper powerful person on Wall Street and in American banking and finance. <laughs> Everybody loves her. She's a fantastic talker. She puts it into real terms. So. Thank you so much for joining well, us. Well, thank you for very kind comments. And you know, you didn't really tell me, I said before we started, I wanted you to give me a little bit of like a something good to give the people that they're not going to get <laughs> everywhere else. You know, you go on CNBC, wah, 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 you know, with all the boring stuff, like what's the cool thing? What's the cool part? I'm a of Brooklyn girl. Dude, I'm see, a that's girl. great. I mean, not now. Now I'm a Connecticut girl. <laughs> Whatever. You know, but, everyone has to sell out at yes. some point. Um, so that's good to know. So you and Barbara Streisand, very close. Yep. Yeah, very close. yeah, we're very close. Yeah, you yes. seem alike. She's my really my godmother. Oh, is that right? <laughs> no. Only separated by 30 years and a generation <laughs> or so. All right, so Jack, let's talk about, um, we're going to do a quick headline hunt here. Facebook, oh my God. It, you know what? It, the good news is we may stop talking about Facebook because if it goes down every day by a few percent, it'll just be zero. It'll be zero, so it'll nothing more so to talk great. about. Exactly. Uh, stock was down another two and a quarter percent today. $28.20 or so. 25% <laughs> off the IPO price. You know what's funny is that you and I have had this conversation, how people kept on coming to us in the months before the IPO and asking us whether they should buy it and how, it wasn't even, it wasn't whether they should buy it, it was how they should buy it. Here, help me, tell me what to do. And of course, we all said the same thing, which was not to buy it. But nobody actually said to us, you know, what will it do? And to the extent that we guessed, I think we probably thought that there would be a pop, but that the reason we told people not to get in was because they'd buy at the top. Never in a million years did I realize my advice would be this good. Yeah, never in a million years did I actually, when I thought to myself, and I swear this is the old trader in me, on that day that it went, that it came out, that I thought, if I had any guts, I'd be shorting this thing. But yeah, I don't do that anymore. I won't do that. And now all I can see is the money I left on the table. <laughs> Dang it! Uh, anyway, it, look, it, the company's not going away. So whatever. We're going to keep talking about it a little bit. It's kind of boring at this point. Um, and there'll be a whole fiasco about you know who knew what when. And I don't think they're going to find anything actually at the end. I, I mean, people may not like the IPO process. Right. But, um, Dutch auctions from now on. Right, Maybe everybody, be a good outcome, and, and yeah. everybody can be an idiot and buy it. It's <laughs> exactly. great. It'd be nice. It would democratize everything. Fantastic. Okay. More importantly, we we're getting some mixed messages on housing. We had some data out today that looked a little bit weird relative to what happened yesterday with Kay Schiller. Um, I'm going to bring Liz Ann in because I want to get your take on where we are in the housing market right now. I think largely the bottom is in, but I think you have to be very careful about analyzing real estate these days. I think you have to go back to the pre-bubble era where housing was all about local and regional. Um, you could not make monolithic calls or statements about housing until the bubble began to inflate. Then you could. Then it was the single national thing. And when the bubble came out, same thing. Now I think you have to go back to regional. So to say housing is bottomed is not really as simple as it might sound. I think largely as a detractor from economic growth that I think has passed us. And I think it will be a fairly meaningful, positive contributor to GDP. That doesn't mean every statistic, every region is starting to lift. But interestingly, and, and we talked about this a little bit before we got on air, some of the sort of ground zero areas for real estate, um, I have a home in Naples, Florida, is absolutely ramping in the last wow. four or five months. So you're starting to see investment money come in. You know, animal spirits are kicking back in. And when you, you know, add a 3.7% 30-year mortgage rate on top of things, record high affordability, to me, it's pretty intriguing. You know what's interesting? When you look at the jobs, and we have a big jobs report coming out this week, you know, in previous recessions, as the economy improved, construction would pop in and, and give you some job right. growth. And obviously, that hasn't been right. the case. At some point, do you expect, or, or at what point do you expect to see uh, some contribution to the jobs picture? I think it's going to start, but we, we, I think the best comparison is to the pre-bubble years because so much of that construction and the related jobs came as a result of, of you know, silly season right. in housing. So I, I don't think we're ever going to get back to those peak levels until we're in the next bubble, and I don't think that's going to be for quite some time. 
But I think we are starting to get to a point where inventories, both of existing homes and new homes, have been worked off enough, particularly when you do it in comparison to the population, that we're probably not all that far off from it being additive, both in terms of confidence in GDP, but also in terms of jobs. When you see the supply out there, we're getting closer to a normal level. Yep. But what that doesn't show is the shadow inventory. How many houses have yet to be foreclosed on or are sitting on banks as real estate owned and haven't actually come out yet? Does that drag this on? Look, it continues to drag it on a little bit. But the good news is, is that if home prices start to go up, the percentage that are underwater starts to drop. The delinquency rate is already right. coming down. So it is not a static number. Those forces going forward can change by virtue of what's happening in the economy, what's happening in the job market, and what's happening in housing. And I don't, I don't find a lot of economists are are applying that fairly simple math to the pipeline right now. Right. Okay. So true. Well, let's get to the uh, big story of the day, which is uh, the stock market stunk it up in the today. We had a <laughs> 160 point loss on the Dow, or 12,419. S and P 500 off about 16 and a half points to 1315. I believe the S and P 500 is about to have its worst month since September. Hmm, how nice. Uh, Nasdaq down 33, 2837. Jack, it looks to me like the only beneficiary today were the U.S. government bonds. <laughs> I heard someone saying, I guess, in fact, I'm not even going to say the name of the person because we're not supposed to talk about him, but he said that Timothy Geithner should just borrow about a billion or $500 billion worth of 30-year bonds right now Yeah. Um, and just One put the six. government in good shape. Raise that ceiling right up and put the government in great shape for years to come. So 1.62%. Lizanne, this is essentially paying the government to just make sure I get my money back in 10 years, right? Well, yeah, but and, and also locking in a negative real return. So explain that. Well, so you've got the nominal yield, which right now is one six and change on the 10 year, but you've got inflation running at a little bit over 2%. So even if you hold it, your 10 year treasury fully through 10 years, you subtract, even if it's a lesser rate of inflation, even if it goes into the high ones, you are locking in a negative real return. So your return after inflation, you guarantee a loss. And so what this tells us is people are really freaked out. People are freaked out. There's a lot of muscle memory. It's muscle memory of um, the end of 07, certainly 08, early 09, flash crash in 2010, the big drop in the market in 2010. Same thing happened in mid-2011. We've got a lot of the leading indicators rolling over again at the same time this year as last year and the year before. And I really think we have changed the psychology of a generation here as a result of the severity of the bear market, but also what happened to the economy and how long lasting it is and how we're now seeing it morph very um, acutely into Europe, obviously. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take quite some time, I think, to, to get those investors back in. Does Europe scare you? Are you freaking out a little bit? Are you losing I, sleep? I, I'm not. Well, I'm a chronic insomniac. So, oh, so that's good for you. you know, which e is anything great. and everything makes me lose there sleep. So I don't know that I would add. Don't this, this is not yeah, contributing this is factor. Not, not necessarily a contributing factor. Um, look, I, I, it's an incredible game of chicken that's being played right now between um, Greece and certainly the stronger countries, as well as policymakers, whether it's ECB or the IMF. And the big question is effectively who blinks first. I think there's a lot of pressure between now and June 17th with the Greek elections. It, it's back and forth in the polls, but it looks like the more moderate parties, the pro-bailout parties are starting to gain some traction again. Were they to actually establish a coalition, it probably means an immediate exit of Greece from the Eurozone is maybe not pushed off, but mm -hmm. maybe pushed out. And that may calm things a little bit, but there's a lot that could happen between now and then. There's been a bit of a run on the Greek banks. There's the contagion into uh, Spain and Italy, which are much more important. I think the size of the Greece economy is smaller than Philadelphia's <laughs> now. So you sometimes have to put it into context, mm -hmm. but it's the contagion effect. And that's where muscle memory comes in, too, is the concern, is this another Lehman? I don't happen to think it is, but that's certainly the Would concern. it be better, on the other hand, would it be better just to rip the Band-Aid off? Probably long term, but there is the uncertainty of what happens in the, uh, in the short term. Um, you know, the, the big issues of, of contagion in the financial system, trade links, um, economic contagion, but then even just the, the small things with contracts written in euros mm -hmm. and how quickly could they be changed to say drachmas yeah get that printing press well there's the only press, there's right? only one printing press right. in greece but it's retired and it's in the museum in athens and doesn't work anymore so you know those are <laughs> i don't know how to say the, the fun things to think about but there's the, the minutia is almost as interesting to think about wow. as the as the big picture issues and meanwhile i mean look we're talking about spain spain had to pay 6.67 percent yep. today for 10 years yep. 
That's getting close to seven. Seven was the level where Greece and Portugal and Ireland had to get bailout funds. What's going to happen well, here? Well, look, I think ultimately uh, you are going to get policymakers to blink. Really? Um, in, in what form that Who takes. Who are you talking to? Make us feel better. Um, I, I think ultimately it's in the interest of whether, you, from a country perspective, you, you talk about Merkel and Germany or the ECB. So, you know, there could be various things that are done. I think the more extreme measures would probably only happen if Greece actually fully defaults and leaves the euro. Then I think the ECB has to step in or maybe the ESM, which is the bailout right. facility, gets um, is, is allowed to to um, recapitalize the banks or maybe they, they are given an actual banking license. Of course, this whole idea of euro bonds, common bonds is being floated. That to me is the ultimate last option. But I think if push came to, sho came to shove and we really went into ultra crisis mode, I think even Germany would give in on those She would stop two. saying nine. She'd say, <laughs> jawohl. Jack, um, should I be nervous about this as an investor? What should I do? Yeah, Tell you know, me, make me feel better. Uh, I, I'm not going to make you feel better. I, I wish I knew. Um, I mean, I try to play out my brain what will, because even all these steps that Lizanne's talking about, you know, the if push comes to shove, does that actually solve the problem? I mean, I think at best it gives time to try to muddle the, their way through, but even then there's so many missteps that could happen and you just would have, you'd, you'd simply exhaust all your options and then you'd have a breakup of the Eurozone. I think what you're Eurozone. talking more is like a, a Euro tarp, really, where you're like saying, we're bringing out the firepower, the ECB is the lender of last yes. resort, we are going to stop this, okay, fine, we let Greece fail, but we're putting a ring around you know, the, you know, that's Lehman Brothers, and now we're putting a ring around Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, Bank of America, City, and they're, they're not going to go. And, that, and that's what you're sort of counting on is cooler heads. Yeah, I, I, I just think we're going to, we may have to get to the actual riot point first. Not that I think uh, we're going to. I just think the ECB is more hesitant to do anything proactive. Right. Um, and, and they have proven to be, and I think will continue to be, a bit more reactive. Now, what that riot point ends up being I don't know. I'm not suggesting an 08 repeat because I, I think that the health of the global financial system, particularly the U.S. piece of it, is so far superior versus what it was right. in 2008. And then the other big difference, there's not a lot of shock value to the potential of a Greek <laughs> exit. I, you know, I'd love right. to know what happy place you've been living in for the last two years if right. you have no idea that this is a possibility. Right. You know, I think the Lehman analogy is interesting, though, because I could say, you know, I could see in, in behind the gilded doors late at night, ECB officials saying, you know what, we're going to we're, we're not going to blink. We're going to force Greece out. And that way, Spain, Portugal, whoever the next conversation is with is going to know we're serious. Just, you know, it was the logic of, of the government in letting Lehman fail. Um, and then, of course, suddenly, oops, maybe Look, we shouldn't there, have done that. There is, there is a thought that there are policymakers, they're not stating it, that they want to use Greece as an example. Yeah. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I don't have any greater color than anybody else, but it's certainly intriguing to think about. Yeah. yeah. And it's also sort of frightening. I mean, not the least of which is that Europeans, I never like to put my lot in the Europeans to solve problems if we think the two world wars were started there. So that being said, um, let's talk a little bit about um, what you think beyond, I mean, we talked a little bit about bonds. Uh, what should individual investors be thinking about as, you know, we, we try not to get them so caught up in these day to days, month to month, yeah. year to year. But, you know, you look at the average Schwab client, and this is somebody who's got a long time horizon, and you don't want them to get caught up in this. What is the individual investor missing right now? Well, it depends on how they're allocated, but those that have gone hog wild into uh, treasuries and, and have really limited or eliminated their exposure to equities, um, we already touched on it. They, they're locking in a negative real return. They have basically no hope of outperforming inflation. Um, you know, you certainly could argue still for a trade in treasuries. I mean, the flows are there. I, you know, I could easily see the 10-year yield at one and a half, maybe even lower than that. But in essence, I think the 30-year bull market in bonds is effectively over. Now, when you transition from a secular bull market to a secular bear market, it can take a few years. It can be fraught with volatility. I happen to think we're doing the same transition in the opposite way with the equity market. Mm -hmm. I think we're in transition from a secular bear market to a secular bull market. But it's same situation, tends to last several years, fraught with volatility, and that's the environment we're in right now. So I think diversification is starting to make sense again. We're, we're less in this risk on, risk off, highly correlated world. Right now we seem to be dealing with some of those forces like we had in the last several years. But I think we're breaking out of this high correlation environment where I think you're going to start to see more differentiation among asset classes and within equities, 
much more differentiation from region to region. And I think decoupling is to some degree a dirty word, but we're seeing that a little bit. I think what, what th this country's economy has ahead of itself, the, the things we are benefiting from, the manufacturing and energy renaissance and narrowing of wage gaps, to me, that is, that's the thing that keeps me excited at night when I think, all right, let's, let's look, forget about the next year or so. Let's look long term, five to 10 years from now. If I were to look back and say, well, what do you know? We pulled ourselves out of this again. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be that we are innovating again and we're actually producing goods and stuff as opposed to just creating, you know, paper wealth like of the just, last or, cycle. Or, or just a place where you can find hunt down your old boyfriend or girlfriend <laughs> online, you know, otherwise known <laughs> as another company. Can Jack, I ask another bond question? Yeah. Because I'm interested in what you think. Let's take a diversified portfolio where maybe somebody would have had 40 percent in fixed income. Obviously, that's not entirely treasuries, right. but it still worries me a little bit. I mean, if we should enter a real bear market, it's something that given what we invest in these days, index funds and so forth, ETFs, no one has actually seen that happen because th before 30 years ago, they didn't have these products. That's right. So what do you do so with that So what we've 40%? been telling investors is certainly be careful if you're, you're if all your, your chips are in the treasury uh, bucket mm -hmm. in, within fixed income. And our bias has been more within treasuries, have shorter duration because you have less risk from yeah. rising interest rates, um, high quality corporates, okay. um, as well as if you have the appropriate risk tolerance, certain segments of high yield. We've also on and off been relatively optimistic on um, munis, but that's obviously very specific to the investor and tax bracket in the region, all of those sure. things. So it's, it's a broad statement that requires more detailed analysis. But so that's that that's what our focus has been within the fixed income sphere. And then, you know, in equities, also believe you don't want to go too far out the spectrum, but we've had a, a U.S. bias relative to developed international markets, relative to emerging markets. And within that, I would say, particularly in the near term, domestically oriented companies, mm -hmm. certainly away from those that have a heavy trade relationship with Europe. Does that argue for small caps? Well, not necessarily, because there are there are larger companies that okay. tend to be more. I would I would say if you're going to screen for companies, first of all, I would screen for growth characteristics. I think growth stocks will outperform value stocks, but the mistake a lot of investors make is they invest based on the labels of growth and value and not the actual fundamentals right. of growth and value. You can find a lot of growth companies that happen to be housed in value indices and vice versa. So focus on growth characteristics, companies that are going to be able to outgrow consensus or outgrow the economy with their earnings. And again, at least in the near term, have more of a domestic orientation. So derive either a larger portion of sales domestically or make sure you're at least not focusing on companies that have a heavy portion of sales to Europe. Will right. you give us a call though when we should buy the Europe ETF? Uh, no. <laughs> no. Uh, no. no. Um, what, so I think that what we need to stress here is that just because you're saying that we had a 30-year bull market in bonds. It doesn't mean you wholesale blow out of, of your bond not. position. Of course not. And you've got to be able to be very clear. We're not here to pick tops and bottoms of sectors and of, of asset classes. Nope. And that's what being a diversified investor means. I think it's so hard for people because they say, well, if you're telling me it's bad stuff, shouldn't I just get out of it, sure. Jack? Yeah. And well, you, which, you, which you could have said four years ago and you would have been way wrong. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. And, and a lot of money has been lost trying to time the bottom in the 10-year yield. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. And as my father used to say, and no one rings a, b a bell at the they top don't. or the bottom. <laughs> they don't. Um, okay. Bruce asked us, uh, when do you expect the European markets to return to stability? Who knows? I think there's, you know, there's a couple of key dates. The, the most dominant one, of course, being June 17th of this year when we have the Greek elections. I think um, Germany, France to some degree, even maybe the ECB more subtly, I think is trying not to engineer the elections, but but maybe guide the voting public as to what they might expect if the most extreme party, Syriza, if I'm Syriza, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right, ends up winning. And it is the case that 80 percent of the Greeks, um, when polled, say they don't want to leave the euro. Yeah, so, so there the, seems to be a disconnect with right. voting and what they actually say. But it was really very it was a small percentage of the population that have voted in the preliminary election. So I think you're going to see a bigger turnout. So that's the big date. If the more extreme party does win, then I think you start to anticipate a very, very quick exit by Greece from the euro. So then you're going to have a few weeks of uh, probably a lot of volatility and a tremendous scramble on the part of everybody involved, whether it's to set up a deposit insurance structure, euro bonds probably come back on the table, at least as a discussion point. 
if 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 it you get the more moderate parties in New Democracy and PASIC and you get a coalition, that probably eases short term volatility. But it, all it really does is is maybe push the inevitable just further out. And then probably the next really big thing is the fall of 2013 when we have the German elections. Mm -hmm. So even if things calm down, but the public still is in this anti-austerity mode, then we could see a change in Germany. So on, it's hard to envision a scenario where there's some date certain where everything's hunky-dory again, Yeah, let us know about that, Bruce, when you find <laughs> that out. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some things going on here, because I hear we have an election coming up this hmm. fall. Jack... How seriously do we need to to take the fiscal cliff situation? And, and, and is that changing investor perception, maybe making people less reluctant to put money to work because they don't know what the tax treatment of certain assets is going to be? Oh, on the one hand, I tend to think that, and, and maybe this is just me, but certainly at the retail level, that, that it's overstated to the extent that people, I, I'm in the Buffett camp where he says, you know, a good investment is a good investment, whether or not the tax on capital gains is 15 or 20 or 25 percent. That said, I, I think any predictions of what the economy is going to do have to take into account the idea that if you take what you know the, the the sum total of the all these things that are happening in January of 2013 and subtract them their their effect on GDP from current GDP it's negative <laughs> um, I, I forget exactly what it is Lizanne will probably I know it's from, somewhere from two and a half the, the to full 4%. number if you assume everything happens on December 31st as expected is uh, close to four percent of GDP wow the likelihood of that happening I think is nil right so the real range is probably something in the less than a percent of GDP to maybe two to two and a half percent of GDP. But you're right. But still, that's close that's to zero. still a good chunk yeah. of, of yes, especially since we're only at two. Gotten. Yeah. yeah, since we're only at two. So yeah. that is a is a big um, chunk of it. I have to think that there will be a lame duck deal that just kicks the can down the road a little bit. I, I, I wouldn't have trouble be imagining shocked something else. if we actually got some color on that pre election. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Because you know, you you've had both um, Alan Simpson and Erskine Bowles say that they are meeting, you know, with somewhere in the forty five to 50 bipartisan members of Congress mm -hmm. trying to work on a deal that probably wouldn't, the, the ink wouldn't dry on it until the lame duck session, mm -hmm. but we may get some sense that this is actually happening. So, you know, <laughs> wouldn't it be nice <laughs> if, if yeah. uh, the I'm supposed sure adults in Washington. Right when I'm uh, ready to go away. It's usually when it happens for me. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. But though, can we pause for a moment just to celebrate that that optimism right there? I mean, the idea that you could have a compromise where I like to think as much about positive tail pain. risks as negative tail risks. <laughs> okay. I think yeah. that everyone is so focused on negative tail risks. Uh, I'm always most intrigued by the story no one's telling, and right. least intrigued by the story everyone's telling. The story everyone is telling is the fiscal cliff is a complete disaster. It's going to cut everything out of GDP. We're not going to get anything pre-election. Nothing even in lame duck. We're going to push this into March. I can't help. It's not my base case. I'm not here forecasting. I can't help but think, well, what if um, we actually have some adults in Washington and they they understand the gravity of this and actually um, play in the sandbox together and get something done? And so how but how seriously should the politician take this call from when Americans say, you know, we're really worried about this national debt? And how how can they weigh that? Because I think that when people say I'm concerned about it, they don't understand. Well, you're concerned about it, but you're about to lose a lot of stuff if we fix it. So how wh what's the middle ground there? That's the that's the interesting point because uh, concerns about debt, even when we've had past debt crises and we've had in the past growth in debt that's even been higher than it is now. We've never had anywhere near this absolute level of debt, but never before has it ranked as high on the priority list when when polling voters. But you're right. We, you know, we, we, you can talk about it in a very generic sense and you start to tell people what they're going to have to give up. And regardless of which side of the political aisle you're on, and if you use Simpson Bowles as kind of a model for what a compromise, a big deal compromise would look like, everybody's got to give and take. The bottom line is I think the public has to come to the final realization that you can't fix, it, fix this without hitting on all three legs of the stool. You have to hit the spending side, you have to hit the revenue side, and you have to hit the entitlement reform side. There is no way mathematically you get it by one or two. It's got to be all, all three. three. Yeah. Yep. Right. And now everybody's going to suffer. The problem there is that, and I, I don't mean to put you in this corner, but that is the argument that some middle of the road 
generally Democrats are making, and certainly on the far right, that is seen as heresy. That, that, well, you know, they say it's a, a spending even, problem, not a tax problem. Even the far right, I think, isn't generally in favor of full-on tax reform that would broaden the base yes. and lower yeah. rates. Yeah. And, and I, I sat on President Bush's 2005 bipartisan tax reform commission. So I've had the experience, like a Simpson Bowles commission, of, of sitting on a commission. It was supposed to be six months. It ended up being a year. Um, there were nine of us. I'm somewhat, you know, I'm largely middle of the road, but there were extremes on the left and extremes on the right. And we came up with what we thought was a was a pretty good set of recommendations, all of which have been collecting, you know, dust in the bowels of Treasury <laughs> oh, since God. then. But One that's... big problem is that those documents are just um, raw meat for attack ads. So no w w whatever position you take, even if you if you say, you know what, everybody's got to take pain, I, I endorse this whole thing, then whoever's on the other side is going to take the ugliest, yes. most difficult choices and throw those back at but you I, on I November 1st. I, you know. I think we have to reframe the argument a little bit. I, I don't, there's no one in in their right mind that would, if you gave them a blank piece of paper and said, design a tax code, you would design <laughs> the mess that we have right now. Right, right. It has been, you know, used for too many things other than raising revenue for the government. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's much messier now than it was in the early 80s when we last thought we needed to reform the tax code. It's gotten even longer and messier and more complicated. Sure. So I, I don't know. I I'm biased because of my involvement, and I, I think I think that's the ultimate solution on the revenue side. I think a lot of revenues could be raised if you maybe not scrapped it, but but really look to broaden the base, lower the rates, get rid of a lot of the deductions, um, and kind of clean things up. And and you think that there's the political will to do this, if explained correctly. Um, They're not very smart, these politicians. Well, we're also honest. in an election season. So right. as Jack said, you're, you're going to get the extremes from both sides in terms of attacks on the other. And more often than not, those tend to be on the fringe issues. Um, right. And yep. it, so in, as, as a full on tax reform, the likelihood that that is a piece of this between now and the election, sure. zero. Right. But, you know, maybe when things come, we're not in, although these days it feels like every minute is campaign season, especially right. with a two hour Two, two hour, two, two year two congressional. Yep. Two hour, it feels like two hours. Right, exactly. But that, that's my hope. Um, before we wrap up, um, since you guys are both sort of merry sunshines, both of you, <laughs> so nice. Jack, what's your, what's your um, bright spot right now? People are feeling glum. They're kind of worried. My May sucked, blah, blah, market's yeah. down. Give me something good to feel. Let me feel good about something, man. Uh, okay, two things. One, um, there's a lot of talk about the lost decade and, and everything else. And, you know, people, you talk about generational shift, people scared of socks. Well, the entire time this has been going on, based on a very simple price to earnings ratio level, stocks have been getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Now, there's no, no rule that says they can't go from, well, what is it? What do we say now? 14, 13? On a forward earnings basis, market's well, trading at 12. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, down, they can't, there's no reason to say they can't go to seven. <laughs> but on the other hand, you know, for people who are investing primarily through their 401k and have many years to continue contributing, then that's really good news because either they're going to keep on buying more shares for less or they're going to finally see things turn up. So that's right. great. And then on Europe, um, again, there's no surprise. I, I mean, if you ask somebody in early 08 if Lehman Brothers was going to fail, if Bear Stearns was going to go under, obviously not. Ask people now if what's going to happen to Greece and the you know, sentiment is very different. So it's possible that a lot of this is priced into the global economy as well. Although, Sorry, I got to be glum again. Oh my um, God! I have to you know, the, the emerging happy about one the emerging thing. markets were always sort of the bright spot, but now I think you know you're seeing slowing in China, you're seeing slowing in India, Brazil. Um, those you're are important down countries. Or stop it already! <laughs> like eight point one percent is not enough for you in China. Good <laughs> Lord, Liz Ann, you are Mary Sunshine. You're feeling good. I'm looking at this report and it says I see some good things. You're happy about low inflation. This is a good thing. Yep. You're psyched about the U.S. manufacturing sector. I, I, that is my that is my biggest thing right now. You're I it. think we are on the cusp of something unbelievably huge, in traditional manufacturing, but also domestic energy, and with the wage gap differentials having narrowed dramatically, particularly here versus China. And I was just in China last week. I talked to a lot of manufacturers over there. We're starting to bring business back to the U.S. That's so great. And I think we're going to start to um, build things and make things and produce things uh, again. And we have a very, very huge consumer in the rest of the world, too. So I, I think we're doing a little bit of a 180 relative to what has driven our economy and the global economy in the last, say, 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Let me bring it down to me. Um, 
You know what? The Rangers lost, so I'm psyched about that because I'm an <laughs> Islanders fan. So that is my bright spot. Go Devils in the Stanley Cup. Uh, you wow. know what? I am also a contrarian. I'm a very natural contrarian, so I can't help but think everybody is talking about the demise of Europe. And so I cannot help but think that we keep getting to this place and that they will grit it out and Angela is going to cave and she's going to have to because she's got more to lose than anybody. And so and the we'll, ECB will pull out the bazooka. And I'm and, thinking yep. it's going to happen. So I'm sort of feeling like if I had any guts again, I'd, I wanted to really do something and go in and buy something there. I'm not saying you should do that. I'm just saying <laughs> consider when everybody is talking about one thing. Yep. Ask yourself, well, what if the other thing happened? That's what and, I do every day. And that's yeah. that's all you have to think about. It has been fantastic. Not bad. A girl from Brooklyn. You've done all right, girl. <laughs> Thank you. You really Thank you. fabulous you. guest. Come back. I will. We Thank love you for having, having me. Thank and you. Maybe we'll, Thank we'll, you. And Megan, will we be able to bring her into our other studio <laughs> through her super-duper special studio? Or no? I think well, we'll bring you into our fancy studio anyway. You'll like it. Okay. It would be nice. Wherever you want me to be. I like that. Excellent. Uh, Jack Otter, a man from Manhattan. Yeah, you did all right. And moved to Brooklyn. And you so, moved to Brooklyn, yeah, so there, there you go. Goes, yeah. You, you um, didn't get the Wasp playbook. Is this our last uh, our last podcast from the studio? This is our last podcast from this beautiful studio. You know, we had a new we have a new um, editor in chief, and she's like, "What's with that studio? It is dumpy and gross." The egg carton. It's yeah. nice. Yeah. It's a little it's a podcast. You know, um, we are moving, and we are actually moving over the course of the month of June. So we will not be here in June. We'll be back in July to tell you about how the euro has either saved or done. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, one way or another, we'll communicate with you. Stay with MoneyWatch.com. We will be broadcasting other vehicles, and we will be writing. And what else? Will making we be doing? videos. Making videos, making fun, doing all sorts exactly. of great stuff. Lizanne Saunders, thanks again for joining thanks us. Thanks for having me. Jack Otter. Uh, great to be we with you. We didn't plug your always. book today. Oh, no. Oh, don't forget to buy Jack's book, <laughs> Worth It, Not Worth It. Simple and profitable answers to life's toughest financial questions. It's like a Jack and Jill show. I love it. I'm Jill Schlesinger. I'm Jack Otter. Thanks for watching Ask the Experts. We'll see you in July. Take it easy in June. Put on that sunscreen.